Hi, how's it going everybody? This is Jeff, Dr. Masaryk, and Chris Casagrande, and we decided that we were going to just take a moment and sit down and have a little discussion for our channel Being Human, and uh, today we're discussing attachments. The plant's not really that great. Hold on a second. Okay. I want your input on uh, attachment. My input on attachment? Yeah. I don't understand why you're attached to that plant. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we're, I think society likes us to be attached to things because it makes us consumers and um, it validates their attachment to the almighty dollar. I don't disagree. Okay. Yeah. Attachment's the root of all suffering, period. Well, it's very simple. It's pretty good. It's simple, but let's play that out in the more complex yeah. ways. So, uh, we had a client here one time, I was talking about releasing attachments, and he said, so, are you telling me to release all of my attachments, right? And so, and what I said was, I'm not telling you to do anything, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm just offering you the opportunity to see how attachments create suffering. Yeah. And when I teach stuff like that, I always say, if you take this to its extremes, what you're, what you're aiming for at that point is sainthood, right? Because if I have no attachments, then when my son dies prematurely, I'll let it go. I don't suffer, yeah, right? I don't feel anything. Yeah, I can't see myself being that dis unattached. Yeah. But. Unless you're a sociopath. Well, well or you're truly a. Um, a, um, a Buddha? You know, yeah. <laughs> right. This is what I say. Like, you're not, you're not shooting for sainthood. I mean, you can be, I suppose. Yeah. But at that point, I'm a saint, right? Yeah. Most saints are dead, though. But then, where does this apply, Chris, yeah. on day to day? How do I, how do I use the idea of decreasing my attachments to decrease suffering without being becoming a saint? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it makes sense with with learning anything new to start with something small. Good. You know, am I attached to this sandwich? Am I attached to this job? Am I attached to this relationship? And work your way up to having no attachments. Okay, so you go to a restaurant. You order a really great sandwich, right? Panera, let's say we're going to Panera. Right. And they got this really nice, you know, crusty bread and the whole thing. They put it down in front of you and right away, you're attached to how great this sandwich is. Yeah, right. you almost can't help it. So you can't help it because Panera is expensive, so you better enjoy that sandwich. <laughs> but that attachment is temporary, so it'll be, because once you're done, it just becomes Right. Yeah. So the suffering comes that when I'm with you having a sandwich and I sneeze on your sandwich. <laughs> right? right? Then you start to suffer because you were attached to that. You got damn yeah, right I was. <laughs> and who raised you? <laughs> <laughs> but you were okay, but so on a on a data see the mysterious attachments are the ones that get me, right? Yeah. Like attachments to the outcomes. That's the one that we talk about a lot. Yeah, 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 we do talk about But also what about attachment to my identity? Like I see this in medicine a lot. They don't say I'm experiencing depression. They no, say I am depressed. I am depressed, yeah. That becomes an identity that they become attached to. I what about my PTSD? Yeah. That's a huge attachment. Yeah. Especially if you have a client that let's say they have seen combat. And maybe two clients have seen the same combat. They were in the same theater of war. One comes home, can't uh, can't uh, regulate themselves and get back to regular society and then there is a person that who went over there did their job they were asked to do it they were trained to do it and they're not uh, experiencing any form of PTSD regardless if they've seen some heavy combat or not okay what would you say about that guy I would say well I know what has been said about people like that they have PTSD they just aren't recognizing or admitting that they have PTSD. <laughs> it's the worst case than we thought. It's a worst case. And <laughs> you're like, realize they have it. he doesn't even, he must be a sociopath. So not only does he have PTSD, but he is also a sociopath, which revealed itself after all of this horrible situation that he's been through. Oh, that's terrible. But I, I can, know, but, but I, I, it's true. I can identify because during a significant portion of my life when I was generally a miserable person, when I met somebody who was really nice and seemed happy, yeah. I was certain they were full of shit. Mm. <laughs> they are hiding something. This yeah. person has got dead people in their coat and they're, you know, so they're killing right. puppies or something, yeah. right? I couldn't, Xanax. right, yeah, right, whatever. <laughs> I couldn't accept that they could possibly be that happy if I'm not. Yes. Mm. And so maybe, Somebody is chained to their basement. 
Right, but yeah. maybe that's what you're talking about when people see somebody who actually allowed themselves to release an attachment to their past, yeah. which is what we tell people. Yeah, we do. Um, and yet we see them do it. We go, oh, you know, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, I don't think we do because this is actually a real case where a guy told us that, or told me that, and I told Chris that, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like okay with everything that happened over there. And it's like, wow, this guy must be sicker than we thought. <laughs> and he's fully functioning, great yeah. guy, doing well, and yeah. all this other stuff. And it's like, well, my, uh, you know, so-and-so therapist has said that, uh, yeah, he's really sick. And it's like, uh, that's not what I'm getting out of it. Wow. It's not like he really is not attached to what he went through. I think the best place to start to take a look at attachment is the suffering that it causes. I think when you can start to identify how we suffer from our attachments, it's much easier to drop them. To look at the, look at them in general. Like sometimes to the group I'll say, um, you know, if you're not willing to start to release your attachments, at least pay attention to the world around you. So you're yeah. watching the news and people are crying about this or that, you know, mm -hmm. their, their dog died or their house got burned or whatever. Start to recognize when you see suffering Ask your outside of you. Yeah. Ask yourself, what is the attachment that caused that suffering? Yeah. And as a beginning, to just to start to notice. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Just to notice it in the world around you, and notice it within yourself. Notice it when you're suffering, and say, "Oh, what's the attachment here?" And I think by realizing that and seeing that and bringing that to light for yourself, it'll kind of you'll start to naturally, without much effort, start to drop attachments. It won't seem as important to you. In fact, it'll seem, I want to get rid of this as quickly as possible. Mm. I personally, I think the most damaging, I should say damaging, the attachment that creates the most suffering for most people is the attachment to your, your ego identity. Yeah. I really think that's the one. Yeah, I agree. It, and and it, it's, uh, I think, in a lot of ways that it's nurtured through social media or, uh, you know, uh, but it's kind of always been there, right? Do you remember when you were a long time ago when we were kids and we we're going into that, you go school shopping. Yeah. You don't want to be made fun of, right? Right. If you went shopping at Kmart, yeah, you, you know, and got your tough skin jeans. Yeah, you didn't want to be, get your ass beat. You didn't want to have the identity of the Granimals kid. Right. Yeah. He doesn't, dude, he's not wearing Levi's, he's wearing fucking Lee's. Yeah. You know? But that was a social pressure for that identity. You might not have embraced it. You might mm. have just taken it enough to keep people off your back. But I think nowadays it, it's probably, you know, if you if you don't drive this car where, you know, that's why you have people that are, uh, what do they call them? They're influencers, right? So you see it more in people that are younger, still trying to figure out who they are that if you don't listen to this music or wear these shoes or you don't like this sports team or drive, whatever, it's one of those things that, that I think is, it's nurtured by um, society and, and promoted in a way to fit in. And I think that's where that idea of influencing came from. I, does that make sense? It does, it, it, but it sounds like you're saying it's something of a, a certain age. I think it's, it spans all ages. I think it begins there. Yeah, but... Uh, I'm attached to my title and my work. Yeah, me okay. too. I'm a ladak. I'm, yeah. I'm a doctor. I'm yeah, a whatever. Yeah. Well, let's think about this then. See if you have a similar story because I can remember as a kid having a like a debate with my father. I was a kid, like I was maybe eight, nine, ten, somewhere around there. And at the end of it, he said, "You'd make a good lawyer." Mm. And I held on to that for years. Mm. That for a while became an identity that I grabbed onto, and it wasn't even anything real. I mean, it was just from based on one argument. Yeah. In your life, how old were you? I'm thinking nine, ten, okay. right around there. In your life, when somebody said something that made you feel special for a moment, mm. did you try to attach to that identity? Probably. Can you think of a story? Probably. Uh, well, not right now. Uh, uh, I can't. You got one? Yeah, that's why I'm in this field. <laughs> I dro I, drove you to where you are now. I remember having a conversation with my cousin, and he said, "You're really easy to talk to. You'd make a great therapist." Wow, and I was twelve or thirteen at the time. Wow, you hold on that. I held on to that. I ran with. It. Yeah. Mm. Huh. I never thought about it until now. 
But I, that might be why I'm where I'm at today, more than any other reason. Sure, I could have easily ended up an attorney if had the um, appropriate opportunities had presented themselves. Instead of just a doctor? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so if you got sued from I guess yeah. you can defend yourself. <laughs> you can always go back to school and get your uh, yeah right. right. Yeah. Get my JD. <laughs> yeah. I think I noticed more of that after because I, once I uh, started working in this field, it just felt right, um, and it was offered by people that I that I respected and 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 helped nurture that environment. So I think when I spoke to other people in my life. They, they tell them what I was doing, and they would that you're that you're you're perfect for that job, because of the ease of being able to, and you're straightforward and did all you that. You find yourself attached to it. After I that? did. Yeah. I absolutely did. I said, oh, I needed that validation because at the moment I wasn't feeling too good about myself. Right. You know. But what do I do now? Yeah. You know? The validation. Right. The, the ego needs to be validated all the time. Right. Uh yeah. So, then, as a way to help people understand, right? Can you think of a story of? A time where you released an attachment? Yes. Uh, friends or acquaintances that no longer served me. And I don't mean that from a narcissistic perspective. No, no, not served you like, yeah. here's your coffee, Jeff. No, not, <laughs> and, and, and by the way. Jeff, can I get you something with that? Yeah, just not that sycophantic sort of thing. It's like, wow, this was a really great life that, you know, and friendship and all of that. And then life changed for me. And those people fought against it or didn't understand that, even though they kind of helped promote it, they'd be like, you know, you need to do this or you need to do that. They give you all this advice. And then you do change. And then they say things like, well, you were much more fun when you were drinking. And, and you're like, oh, that made it easy for me which was painful. So right. releasing the attachment to that person kind of happened on just by osmosis. I yeah. Guess. yeah. Well, yeah, the realization it sounds like. Yeah. We yeah. realized, whoa, that wasn't, that's, they like who they thought I was, not who I am. Yeah. 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 And when you have that tight grip, that tight attachment to your sense of self, it's very difficult to allow yourself to become something new. Yeah, it gets in the way. Your yeah. identity. Yeah. yeah, I'm holding on to this. I can't become that because I'm still holding on to this. Who am I if I'm not this? Yeah, I, I was know. Jeff, life of party, last guy to leave the. Yeah, the, you know. Who did you become after that? Uh, <laughs> Jeff, the the uh, the insecure, uh, totally detached mess of a human being that couldn't put down a bottle of vodka. Yeah. So, you know, and after that. And you get nurturing, you know, statements from people and they say, well, you know, you just have to, you know, you just need to stop drinking. You need to change your life. You need to do all of those things. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you do it and you kind of double down. You start working in the field and learn more about neurobiology and all that other stuff. And you don't want to go and hang out and watch the Celtics game while they're ripping on the bomb. No, you don't want to yeah. do that anymore. And it's not because you don't like them. It means that you're kind of decided that that's not a lifestyle that I want to be a part of. So you release your attachment to the people and the activities. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. See, I remember maybe this is a thing. The activities change the attachment to the people. Right. It kind of happened. They were together. Mm. They were. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's a good one. I attached that lifestyle to certain particular people. So if you didn't release those attachments, yeah. then you would miss them. You would mourn them, yeah. and you might even seek them out and return to them. Mm. Wouldn't? The, how many people that we see that have relapsed say, "Well, I went back to my old friends." A lot. Yeah, those are people who haven't released those attachments. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean, that's what it is. Somebody said, uh, I can't remember who said it, but said, "Think of people as the booster rockets on the side of the of the um, shuttle, shuttle, the space shuttle." Yeah. And uh, as you know, there's one center rocket one the large rocket and the two boosters yeah and when you reach a certain level in the atmosphere the boosters detach because they no longer serve you they've spent their fuel right if you didn't let them go yeah you wouldn't be able to travel any higher or faster right so you're giving a metaphoric narrative to of letting attachments. Le release yeah. of attachments of yeah. people i didn't come up with it somebody i was watching on on the internet did but i thought wow that what a great metaphor of 
if you didn't release those, you wouldn't be able to you get made it. You yeah. would have made it. Yeah. You would have made it out of the app. Probably could say that for all of your attachments, isn't it? Yeah. Like, that happens when you're a kid anyways. You're, you, the kids that, very rare is your best friend in kindergarten still your best friend today. Yeah, it is very rare. You know? But some people don't let go of it. That's where they suffer. Right. I miss him so much. I wish we were still friends. Uh, blah, blah, I wish blah, blah. it was the way it used to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I had an unhealthy attachment to our last job. I did too. It, I, was, I was struggled to let that go. I, I did too. As though it was a great thing to let it go. It was. I could see at the time. No, it was. It, it was got me painful. as far as I needed to go, and then I needed to take the next step. But letting that go felt yeah. like I was losing something of myself. And I um, I remember. I don't remember the, like the moment, but I I remember. Uh, there was a time, and maybe this is a guy thing, and I hate to pick on guys, but because I'm one of us, so there was a time in my life where I almost had to be right. That's the rumor, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I I couldn't tolerate if, if I wasn't right in a situation. I wasn't the one who had the answer or knew what to do or whatever. Yeah. And and that was definitely letting go. Of that was part of ego identity. Yeah. But it's only a piece, right? Yeah. Maybe the ego dies in bits and pieces. Maybe. That that piece. It's huge though. Uh, yeah. That, that need, that suffering from not being right. Yeah, right. As, as silly as that sounds, I, I would suffer from not having the answer. Right. Or being it, proven wrong. Because it said something bad about me. Yeah. yeah. I'm supposed to know the answer and I don't. That means there's something wrong with me. See, I think the death of the ego, the, the attachments, I think they die one by one, but it's like dominoes. Once you start it, they start falling. They start to fall faster yeah. and they start to affect each other it feels good not to suffer from attachment so you look towards the next thing to let go of but then people think you have something wrong with you yeah they sure do <laughs> well why aren't you sicker than you are i don't know <laughs> why aren't you upset about this yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well I, go, I get that a lot go yes to yes go. i do too i get that a lot in a lot of places in my life but yeah go to a funeral of somebody that you know that died and and be unattached you know yeah. and watch there'll be some people like why is he upset? Why isn't he crying? Why isn't he, you know? Yeah. I accept that death is part of life and that people move on and, and, you know, that's fine with me. I'm okay with that. But if we were trying to teach somebody to start, I think, because we go to this all the time, is attachment to the outcomes. I think that's a great starting spot. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's easy to see and it helps keep you in the now. You know what I mean? And I always remember that we had a conversation about it was a particular client that was struggling that you had done a lot of work for and he had left and he was, he was, falling apart everything was falling apart for him and, and Jeff was very upset about it and Chris said Jeff you're attached to the outcome and Jeff goes no I'm not yes I am <laughs> <laughs> and that he was suffering about this yeah. person aware of it yeah you immediately know, pulled it back as soon as he said you you resisted for half a second just long enough to switch to the no I'm not yes I am yeah that's exactly how you did it too and yeah. And I always remember that when I think I about like Gollum at that point, releasing it. Shut up! Because you were upset yeah. that he was struggling and failing. And yeah, of course. And Chris pointed out immediately you weren't upset about his struggling and failing. You were attached to what the outcome was supposed to be. And, in I, your and, head. and I can break that down. And it was, and a lot of it became ego. Yeah. That his success is based I on. I can't help him. That says something about me. Right. Ah. His success is based on the narrative that was created by somebody above me that said that this is important and that's why you have this case. You're gonna get through to this guy. And so I went, yeah, I want us to be successful. <laughs> and us. I'm like, us. us. Not you. Uh, yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> Not you, <laughs> me through you. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, wow. Yeah, this guy wanted to kill me when he first met me. I'm going to get through to him. Yeah. I'm going to change him. I'm going to fix him. Yeah. That was it. And it went poorly. <laughs> yeah. Until it didn't. But. And yeah. I had nothing to do with whether it went well or not. But your experience of suffering was related to the attachment. Uh, yeah. I was, yeah. I was attached to his yeah. outcome. Per perfectly defined, I think, what yeah. we're saying, what we're talking about here. Yeah. But when you start to let go of those attachments, People don't understand it. No, not they understand guess. how they're not. You're not attached to it. They don't. They, I remember. Um, no, they think there's something wrong with you. Yeah, I was in a meeting and I, I was fighting vigorously for one side, and they went a different direction. I said, "All right, 
And then they called me like an hour later, are you okay? I was like, yeah, why? They couldn't understand because they're so attached to their the outcome and their plan. They couldn't and see the, me not being attached. Yeah, and they're projecting right. it onto you. Right, so of course. Well, I'm upset. Course, you must be he's, upset. He must be ready to quit. Yeah. He's the clinical director. He should be mad as hell. <laughs> and he was like, no, oh, he just went on with his day. Right. No, I'm letting it attach. Go. I think so if I were going to explain it to people and try to simplify it, right? Attachment to the outcome is like, say you're building a birdhouse. And while you're building the birdhouse, all you're thinking about is how it's going to look when you're done. In that moment, you're not only attached to the outcome, but you're missing the process. You're not fully engaged in the experience of what's happening right now. And um, I, I, I mean, can you think of another way to explain it? No, that's perfect. Yeah, it's that's it. If you're... And when you're missing the experience of it because you're attached to the way it should be. And when you do that, you're also limiting yourself. And setting yourself up for disappointment yeah. if it doesn't turn out exactly the way you want it to. i got to become a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. And anything not lawyer is a failure. Right, and, because and, of you're so attached to the outcome. Right. And hurt so badly. And that's Unless he's a doctor. Right. Yeah. 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 Then he upped himself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like judges. <laughs> um, I see it here uh, in a, at the residential. <laughs> I see it at the, right yeah. Yeah. See at the residential program. One of the biggest struggles I see is attachment to the outcome of a faltering relationship. Yeah. So when they come into treatment, they have a relationship that's in a mess, and they are so concerned about where that's going to go that they're hardly at all engaged in the process of their personal growth. Yeah, yeah. still outside. Yeah, yeah. And, and then not realizing to fix that relationship, they're in the perfect place to work on themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have no control over that outcome because that's a yeah. two-person decision. So being attached to what you want it to be uh, creates suffering and right. it creates a lack of presence. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like a good place to stop. It does. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Maybe, that. maybe yeah. we should have done an introduction. Nah, oh Next time. maybe. Well, we could do well, actually, I can edit. splice it in. Yeah. Ready? All right. Everybody put your hands up like this. That's where I know to cut it. Oh, all right. Okay. I don't yeah. have one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't have the clap? Up. No. I'm going <laughs> to go like this. All right. And uh, who's going to do the introduction? Uh, Selfish. Yeah, you're in the middle. Me? You're in the center of the camera. I, I want to do a Monty Python skit so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, the cheesy you. music. Yeah.